and how you came to Palmyra. Were you born here, or did you come here later? So tell the story that you were just telling me. And then we'll talk about uh, how you found life in Palmyra, you know, why you came, and, and did you, were you satisfied when you came to Palmyra? And then we're going to talk about the thing, where you worked, you worked at Hershey, and the fact that I understand you were the fire chief at one time in Palmyra. Tell us a little bit about that. So we'll go into that. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we ready, Steve? Yep. Okay. Tell your name very clear and, and how you came to Palmyra. My name is Louis Martin Jr. I came to Palmyra on the 2nd of January, 1922. I formed me from Schmoker. Just stop one minute. Are we going to get that? Is <laughs> He's awfully quiet. Yeah, he is. I'm thinking I better get in a little closer. And we'll start over. And we'll start over. And you have to watch. You can't squeak this. Because it keeps squeaking. <laughs> okay. Look at that refrigerator is. Oh, is that loud? Too? That's what I'm hearing. Well, should we move? Hearing. Should we move back in that corner? No, nah, it, it should be all right. Now, now that I'm closer. Should we pull the plug on it? <laughs> It'll be all right. That's right. Do we start off? Yeah, we'll have to start over. That's why I wanted to stop you fairly soon. Yeah before you went too far. Because I want to make sure that we hear your story. So, okay? All right, so we'll start over and you can tell us who you are and how you got to Palmyra. My name is Lloyd Martin, Jr. I moved to Palmyra January 2nd of 1942. I formerly lived back at Indian Town Gap, but I was only there about a year. Because before I come to the Gap where I worked for two years, I lived in Chimogan, and uh, I brought a truck down here, worked at the Gap those two years, and then uh, I uh, lived back there at the Gap for about a year, and from there I, uh, I got a job in the Hershey Chocolate Factory. I uh, had quite a drive from there to Hershey, and I got the opportunity in the house here at Paul Meyer, so it was the 22nd of January of 1942. I moved to North, Rail North Railroad Street. And uh, I was there until I went into service. And while uh, I was in the service, my wife and son stayed there until the house was sold, and then they had to move out. And they found another place. And that's where I went to. That was just a block away from where I originally lived. It was in the 600 block there. And from there, I took uh, a lot of money to the house on West Maple Street. And uh, that's where I'm at today. Okay, so you were, you were a transplant, more or less, to yeah. Palmyra, yeah. but stayed. Why do you think you stayed? Well, I went to Hershey 38. Okay, yeah. so your employment so at Hershey. I bought the house and it satisfied me. It's not a big one. It's one of the smaller ones back there. And uh, it was plenty big enough for the three of us. We only had the one child, my son. But you raised your child here then? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, he's a school teacher, seventh grade school teacher. Oh. Middle school. In Palmyra? Yeah. Oh, great. So he went through the Palmyra system yes. and then went on to college and then came back. Yeah, he went to Penn State and he came back here. Great. And then I had a granddaughter. She's two years younger than him. He's working for the Social Security office, some office associated with the Social Security in Harrisburg. But uh, that's the only two grandchildren I have. My uh, granddaughter was pregnant, had two boys, but she lost them. Oh, no. Miscarriage, and she lost them. But uh, that's the only family I have right now. My wife died in 75, and I'm still living back there by myself. Well, can you tell us how old you are now, though? I was 93 in uh, July. You were 93 in July, so you've lived here a long time. Oh. And become a senior citizen of yeah. Palmyra. So yeah, I would think even though you weren't born here, 
you have some stories to tell about Palmyra. I lived up there in Railroad Street for a while. When I came back from the service, my wife was in a different house. What I was with her, a restyled barn, an old jet home. And my, my wife was going to start the furniture and then move with her parents who had moved here in town while I was away. And uh, here was a restyled barn, but my wife saw it. She said, well, we'll store our furniture in here, but she said, we'll keep enough for us to live with. She said, because if he lived there, so can we. Okay. So that's where we lived, even at a two-car garage in my car. Oh, wow, that was handy. Yeah. It was an old barn where the kitchen was. Where the horse was staying in the back of the barn, they made the kitchen out of that, and then upstairs you made two rooms in the living room. Oh, that sounds good. But that's not the house you moved into later. This no, was this is the one after you um, on West Maple Street. Okay. Great. I, I guess in those number. Well, let's see. You've been here. You've been here for sixty some years then, yeah. right? Um, in that time, you've seen a lot of changes in the styles of houses. Oh yeah. In I know a lot of people that had bought these smaller houses that you could get right after the war. Mm -hmm. Because my house has some used lumber in it. Back in the town gap, they had a big deck there, a four inch oak, that they taught the soldiers how to load and unload ships. They had a big post in the center, that's on the ship. And they, uh, Mott's Rule, the guy built my house, he bought that lumber. Okay. Had it ripped up in three by fours, and that's what my house is made. Oh, that's great. A heavier number, you know. So, um, Mott, you said Mott's Rule was your builder. There were a number of, of uh, contractors that were sort of the staple of Palmyra, weren't there? I remember Sherwood Kiefer. Who else were some of the... Carlos Adams. Carlos Adams. Okay. And, uh, I was several of those two, but I just can't remember her name. No, that's okay. I can't remember like I used to. Well... <laughs> I hope when I'm 94 I look as good as you and, and speak as good as you do. That's great. Tell us, I, I know there's um, a number of people in town have mentioned your name because they connect you with the fire company in town. Tell us about your connection with the Palmar Fire Company. Well, I, I was a fireman, a regular fireman. Went out and the man, the hoses and ladders and stuff. And then uh, after I got in there, well, then they some of the older fellows weren't bothered much anymore with it because they were getting too old. At my age, I was only 30 then. A couple of guys suggested that I take back on it because when I worked in Shemokin, I worked for a white truck agency. I was a truck driver, truck mechanic. And uh, there was a we had five or four trucks over here in the fire company. Oh, okay. And they did the work on once in a while. And we had a chief engineer, Roy Riser was a chief engineer. And uh, I, I'd helped him with different jobs. And probably all pitched him when there was work to be done. Like what they could do, they did. a big responsibility. People don't understand that the volunteer firemen don't have much of a personal life because they're always being called out. Right now the fire goes off a lot. While I was there, a friend of mine, the Hershey Fire Company, was a radio man. He talked me into getting a bunch of used army rig a bunch of them. They didn't work out too good. And then finally we decided to buy a group. I still love my mom. Do you really? So you you know where all the fire cars, calls are today? 
Yes, you know, if you can hear my hands here in town, you know, we play a print handheld unit that they have. Oh, okay. You don't hear the conversations. Ah. I do for all the other copies of them. What surprises me as much as anything, I can sit here and hear the Shemokin fire alarms going off and hear them talk. Oh my goodness! I know where the fire are in Shemokin. And you you know Shemokin, so know you know Shemokin. you can understand that. You said they had four fire trucks in 1957. That seems like a lot. Well, we had we had three puppers, and then I don't know the ambulance was the other unit. That was the other unit. Okay. The ambulance. But then uh, since then, my we brought, well, the first uh, squad truck we brought was. Uh, the Legion's uh, van truck, when they hauled their van truck. I remember that. <laughs> we, we bought that truck and we remodeled it okay. the way we wanted it. Uh -huh. And uh, what helped there a lot, the guy could get in that and sit in the seat. He had his back, the air packed right back of him, slip his arm in the harness, and when we get to the fire, he's all hooked up ready to go. Ready to go. Yeah. We had some pretty bad fire. I remember a family, the, the father, four, four or five children, and all burned up in the fire out and go on the SWAT tire. Oh, no. And uh, the, uh, I don't know what this was caused it, but the mother did, she jumped out of the window and she, she was still living today as far as that. Do you know what decade that was in? Was it like in the 60s or? Yeah, that was in the 60s. Just like the Greystone Manor over here, Mr. Schneider owned it. Mm -hmm. He had a box right here in town. I don't know what happened. Nobody just seemed to know. And but he passed away, I understand, in that fire in as fire, well. He lost his life in the fire, yeah. And that was his home at the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all that thing there, when we, we were having bingo. It was on a Saturday night. We had bingo in the fire hall. Because it was right across the street from the street, fire hall. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, we went right over there and I uh, went to the basement door because I figured that's where he was down there. And I opened that door, I had a shot of flames just, just flew through out that door every time I opened it. We eventually found them right inside that door. And that family had burned up in the same way. They got to the inside the door. They couldn't get out. When asked chief, what were your responsibilities? At the, at the same time, I was Just one second. Guys, you can't talk, okay? You can't talk. We're going to have to move because this isn't going to work. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. As chief, I was asking you, as chief, what were some of your responsibilities? Well, it's directly. Do had a fire once. Okay. And uh, also, uh, I, I was an uh, assistant to the police fire marshal for the whole fire department in the town. I was chief. I assumed we were doing the same thing. It gives you a little more authority because I know that I had my, well, the true fact. I lot faster. Yeah. Now, did you do? Did you direct most of the training for the firemen? Okay. 
Wednesday, Wednesday nights we did train. Your fireplugs. You have to go around and, and um, empty those every so often too. How many how many fireplugs were in town when you were responsible? You didn't remember. I know at least once a year I would go around with the instruments and check the flow of the plugs. If you get a bad plug, then we go to fire the fire. But anyway, uh, today it's a different story because it isn't owned by the local water. Yeah, that's true. Um, let me ask you a question. You came in 42. Did you? Come on the the fire team right away. No. The reason I ask that is that I have a DVD that I use of 1939, and they show the firemen in 1939, and they had an ambulance that was actually a hatchback, like a hatchback car. Yeah, the station wagon. Yes, right, right, okay. And was that still being used when you got on the the forcer? No, the it switched over to Cadillacs. Okay. We we bought Cadillacs for a couple of years. To start off with, that was uh, the Amherst Corps was headed there by Wilson Miller. Wilson Miller. Okay. Yeah, but it came over into the fire company's control because I know I had assigned the titles when they bought the new Amherst and stuff. Okay. And I was, and uh, eventually there was a little conflict there. And in fact, I, there was a building built put together to move the Amherst Corps out of the fire company. Okay. But it was, we bought the Amherst as the sun. And they're, they're still together today, aren't they? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Not today. Hershey bought it. Oh, so we don't have an ambulance corps in town. There's an ambulance corps here, but it's, it's Penn State. Oh, okay. And that's who owns the ambulance. Ambulance. Uh, Are they, is the ambulance housed in the... Firehouse. There's usually an ambulance, and there was a garage built over there. Uh, I can't remember just who had that property. But across the alley, back in the fire hall. Okay. There was an ambulance kept in the garage there. So it's there at all times, but yeah, it's not owned by the fire hall. Oftentimes, two ambulances. One is the paramedic, and the other is the transportation. That reminds me, as fire chief, I know that, that in order to have all these fire trucks and the ambulances in the early days, you had to do fundraising. As yep. fire chief, were you responsible for the fundraising, or did you have another? No, no. we in our meeting, the president would uh, give you a point to somebody. He wasn't always the chief, but I was his Okay. We went around knocking door to door. I had to go to our council meetings, and uh, that was brought up because of some of the problems with traffic. And Bill Wirt was the chief of police at the time. Mm -hmm. the name just I know. Through. I'm glad. I'm glad it did. Bill Wirt. That's yeah. right. And uh, we uh, tried to uh, get some of the younger guys to get in there because these older fellas that were too old to fight, okay. and they were even having trouble doing that job. Uh, we got some of the younger guys to get in. In fact, some of these guys today uh, beat me as the head of them today. Now, he was one of my fire police. Okay. When I was a chief. He was a fireman or he was a fire police? He was a fire policeman. He was a fire policeman, right? Yeah. And uh, that's the way it worked. I, when I got in there, I got a bunch of younger fellas in there with me. He says the older fellas were just... You're out in all kinds of weather, yeah. and uh, the traffic is a problem. Today, the, the traffic is, is scary like, to be out. Like, like me at my age. <laughs> I'm not running anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, we, I think you're allowed to retire. Yeah. Well, our time is sort of uh, wrapping up, but let me ask you, uh, from the stand-up point of Palmyra, what was one of your significant memories of life in Palmyra? Because even though you weren't born here, you certainly lived here a, a good many years, and what's a significant memory of Palmyra? 
Well, I had one child, one son, and uh, his first thing is he said when I bought this house on West Maple Street, he says, yeah, when I was in kindergarten and first grade, he says, that's great. He says, I had a walk from the 700 block to the school, what's in the Bay Manor. <laughs> right, from the 700 block of Railroad Street yeah. all the way to the Railroad School. Yeah, now, right. now he says, you buy a house right on top of the school. <laughs> said it was better. Yes. But uh, I just uh, got to know a lot of people. We ran bingo in the fire hall. Got to know a lot of people. And I was accepted as, as an old timer as far as that is. But uh, a lot of these guys want to talk about this guy and that guy in school. I said, well, I didn't go to school. <laughs> yeah. so, but do you think it was Palmyra was a great place to raise your son? Yeah. To, to Okay. Might be out of, it, out of mind a little bit. I moved to Palmyra. I was glad I did the movie at home this time. Because in the morning, the sun is shooting the eyes when the people start coming to her. And in the evening, the same way. Well, you know, someone told us that when they were being interviewed, they said they, I forget where they worked, but they said every morning they had to go with the sun in your eyes and then. Yeah. At, at, when they came home, the sun was in their eyes. So in this case, uh, by living in Palmyra and working at Hershey, you didn't have to worry about that. You had the sun to your back in the morning and the evening. And the evening. Yeah. That's a great thing. So you worked for Hershey for 38 years? Yeah. Okay. And you were in the fire company for how many years? Well, since 1947. 1947. And when did, they, when did you decide to retire from the fire company? 79. Okay. Very good. Okay. I bought a trailer. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Thank you. I retired at 62. I know that. You retired in 62? No, at 60. You retired at 62. And look, I bet you never thought you'd be here at 92. Oh. 32 years later. What have you done in your retirement? Well, I bought a trailer, I bought a little one. Well, then one day I heard about a guy that had an Airstream trailer for sale. Okay. And by the name of Bell, back in Walton Street. I went back and I bought that one. So that's, you've been camping in your retirement? Yeah. Well, that's great. My wife loved that. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, too, I, think. I was born about eight miles from the middle of the school. Oh, okay. And that's my cabin spot most of the time. Okay. My brother's working. In fact, a girl that lived in the next house to me when I was going to first grade to school, there was two girls, two sisters. And one of them eventually married one of the Canova boys. Oh, uh, okay. And if you're familiar with Canova, there. No, I'm not. Well, there's a covered bridge to go to the campground or across from the covered bridge is a nice big brick house. Okay. That's where and she that's where she lived. lived. That's where so she you lived. got to see her when you went up to Yeah, the, and I had relatives working in there. I still have relatives working in there. I think a lot of people from the Palmar area go to Knobles. They do. Yeah. I know Frances does. Because I know she likes it up there. Yeah. Yeah. Well we're finished here for now. Okay. Thank you so much. So, uh, I appreciate that you came in. Yeah, well, I'll tell Fred when I see him. I hope I didn't move anything.